and welcome to this week's Wildlife Wednesday Weekly Roundup. I'm your host, Tenley Thompson, and we've got some amazing videos to show you all this week. The way this is going to work is I'm going to go ahead and show you some of the best sightings our guides have taken video of throughout the week. Then you'll have a chance to win a trivia question for our Eco Tour Adventure Store. Lastly, I'll be answering your questions live. So if you've got any questions, feel free to ask them in the comments section. Maddie, another wildlife biologist and naturalist from EcoTour Adventures is manning our comments section this week. So make sure to say hi to Maddie and he's here to answer your questions as well. But let's go ahead and get started. Laura and Mike had a pretty amazing view and a pretty amazing week with one of our favorite grizzly bears and the most famous grizzly bear in the world, Grizzly Bear 399. Let's check it out. Hi guys, it's Laura. This week I've been delighted to find Grizzly Bear number 399 and her four cubs of the year up in Grand Teton National Park enjoying an unprecedented amount of service berry. The four cubs and the mama bear are looking really great leading up to their winter hibernation. They're fattening up on the service berry, eating them by the truckload. Service berry are a great source of food for grizzly bears as well as black bears this time of the year. Now people also love to eat service berry. I especially love them in pies, but Native American tribes also use service berry in a food source that they called pemmican. Now pemmican is a mixture of dried meat, for example, venison or bison meat, or even fish in some cases, dried like jerky and mixed with dried berries and also animal fat or lard as a binding agent to make almost like a jerky to save it for later times of the year when food wasn't as plentiful. Service berry is really nutritious for these bears to be eating. They're more nutrient rich than a blueberry with about a third more protein than in the same amount of blueberries or same weight of blueberries. They're also higher in calcium, vitamin C, fiber, iron, and magnesium. <laughs> so go mama bear for feeding your cubs good foods. <laughs> now some unexpected food sources that bears enjoy may be army cutworm moths this time of the year. Army cutworm are a type of moth that fly to the greater Yellowstone ecosystem from the Midwest to have a, a mating season high in the Absorca Mountains of southeastern Yellowstone National Park. Now, on slopes with army cutworm moth, researchers may find groups or what appears to be herds of bears <laughs> enjoying those moths. I've heard reports of 20 to 30 plus bears on the same talus slope on sides of mountains up there in really remote places. Personally, I've never had the chance to witness it, but I can't wait for the chance to see them someday. Other things you might not expect bears to be eating could be ants, fireweed, thistles, grasses and sedges, dandelions, earthworms, mushrooms, sometimes birds, and even other bears. Years ago, Yellowstone National Park featured a, a bear that had a webcam or point of view cam attached, attached to him. And honestly, this bear didn't make it more than a football field's distance before stopping for a bite to eat. <laughs> One of the food sources that the bear arrived upon was another bear and he did eat the, the bear, which I know sounds awful, but everybody's got to eat. And remember, this is the wild where all bets are off. A hungry bear is a hungry bear. So Grizzly Bear 399 was eating service berry, even on days when they were fully frozen. We had a blizzard this week and uh, she and the cubs went to their you know, currently favorite food source 
and consumed the berries even when they were frozen. This year seems like a boom crop or bumper crop of service berry. The bears have been going crazy over them, which is amazing to witness. <laughs> but it's a good thing that grizzly bear cubs stay with their mother for two to three years, considering that they're not learning that many other food sources at the moment from their well-versed mother. Grizzlies will keep their cubs around for two to three years on purpose so that those cubs have the opportunity to learn all the different food sources that they may have to choose from on a bust year of berries. So their success depends on how much information their mother is able to give them in their first few years of their lifetime. Besides that phenomenal look at Grizzly Bear 399 and her really cute cubs, I also got a great look at a black bear on my way up to Yellowstone National Park the other day. This black bear was living in a burned area, a forest that burned just a couple years ago in late summer, which is normal and natural in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. The bear ran along the roadside and possibly looking for a place to cross and so that he wouldn't get hit, I was able to pull off and turn on my hazards to s slow down traffic. And he safely made a, a run across that road. Black bears and other wildlife may enjoy recently burned areas. More sunlight comes through the canopy than in an old growth forest. A lot more sunshine hits those shrubs, those bushes, grasses and sedges, than in a, a thick canopied forest. Also the ashy soil provides great nutrients for those plants, as well as a more impermeable layer for water, so that water stays closer to the surface in that newly sprouted forest. Lodgepole pine trees are able to repopulate themselves by producing a specialty cone called a serotonous cone that roasts and releases its seed just after the forest fire event. I consider lodgepole pine a pioneer species. They're able to pioneer the landscape immediately after a disturbance. So thank you for watching. I've been so enjoying these bears. It's been so fun out there. Uh, if you ever have a chance, please come see us. We'd love to have you. Cheers, guys. Thanks, Laura, for that great view of everybody's favorite 399. Now, I will tell you, we had some great footage from our guide, Mike Vanyan, in there, where 399 was awfully close to the camera. And it's really important that we at EcoTour Adventures really feel strongly that an appropriate distance is important. Not just for legal reasons, you need to be 100 yards from any bear in the national parks while on foot, but also for ethical reasons. 399 desperately needs the space she needs uh, to go ahead and raise those cubs fat and fit. We did have a Wildlife Brigade National Park Service member ask us to park our vehicle where Mike was parked and we were lucky enough to be right there while they were in the vehicle. She crossed the road right in front of them. So we don't want folks to get the wrong idea. It's always important to keep an appropriate distance, but it's also really important to follow park ranger instructions, which is exactly what Mike did there. And he just got lucky enough to get that great footage. So a big thanks to Laura and Mike. And it was a really, really fun week for bears. Bear activity is continuing to increase throughout the park as they get into full-blown hyperphagia, stuffing their faces 24 hours a day. We've got lots more great bear footage that will be coming to you next week that I just received this morning, so I didn't have quite enough time to turn around for you, particularly from our guide, Mike, who had a great adventure in Yellowstone that he's gonna tell you about. In the meantime, I thought it'd be really fun to hear from our naturalist and biologist, Tyler. Tyler joined us this year after working for quite a few years as a bird biologist, and he's come into the greater Yellowstone ecosystem with a bang. Rather than making him talk about birds, which is his passion and love, if you really wanna go on a birding trip, Tyler's the one to go with, I thought I'd have him talk about moose because everybody loves moose. Let's check it out.
Hello everyone, my name is Tyler Greenlee and welcome to Wildlife Wednesdays. I'm here in Grand Teton National Park and it's not only the mountains that draw people to this amazing landscape, it's also the wildlife. One animal in particular has captured the attention and love of so many people. Let's go check that animal out. Moose are the largest members of the deer family. In Grand Teton National Park, moose can weigh up to 900 pounds or about 400 kilograms. However, the moose here are the smallest moose within North America. Moose in Alaska can weigh up to 1,500 pounds. The moose within Grand Teton National Park form a very distinct niche among the other herbivores. They live primarily along riparian corridors, areas with cottonwoods and willows, and they browse those bushes and trees. Here you can see a pair of moose browse on what looks like, what looks like willows or choke cherry. They have very specialized lips and muzzles so that they can prick and prune leaves off of vegetation and sometimes it even looks like they're stripping leaves off like corn on the cob. One thing that's really interesting about moose is they do have what is known as a dewlap hanging from their throat. Oftentimes we get guests asking exactly what that piece of skin and fur is hanging from their throat and it is known as a dewlap and we believe it's used for attracting mates during the rut. Here we have a bull moose eating some interesting vegetation. It is feeding on sagebrush, which is full of tannins and harsh chemicals and is not typical to the moose's diet. Here you can see how the moose uses its muzzle to prune fresh leaves and branches off of the bushes. One thing you'll notice about this individual bull moose is that his antlers are covered in velvet. That is a layer of skin, blood vessels, and nerve endings that help his antlers grow in the summer. In December and January, bull moose do shed those antlers after the rut and then almost immediately start regrowing them. It's a very long process. But one thing that's cool about antlers is that they are the fastest growing bones in the animal kingdom. They can actually grow an inch per day. However, this is very metabolically expensive for moose to produce these antlers. And so really only the bulls have them because it's too expensive for the females to actually have antlers. One thing that's also interesting is when the bulls are shedding that skin, those that layer of tissue that helps the antlers grow, they actually will eat the skin coming off of their antlers. And that's to recycle essential nutrients. Those blood vessels, that skin did circulate quite a bit of nutrients and energy while they were growing. And by recycling that nutrients, the moose can actually save on energy. Around August and September, the moose will scrape their antlers on trees and shrubs to remove that velvet, which is what you can see here. This bull moose who actually has a very nice draw tie, drop tine on him. And so that's a, that's a point that actually drops down off his antler instead of pointing upward. Uh, the moose do scrape their antlers on the bushes and trees to remove that velvet. And sometimes it gives the, the moose a very bloody battle-worn appearance, uh, which is kind of what this guy is looking like now. He has that, he has that blood and blood on his antlers and it almost looks scabby. The antlers are really important for moose during the rut, not only to fight other males, but also to avoid fights. Before an actual battle between bull moose, the males will walk side by side, eyeing each other up and down, sizing each other up and deciding if it is worth putting the energy and risking injury in a fight. Animals typically don't want to fight each other. They don't want to risk injury. And so bull moose, just like all the other herbivores, will only fight if they absolutely need to. Here we have a pair of bulls feeding and they are both in velvet. During the non-breeding season, bull moose actually live in what we call bachelor herds. That is where they gather up together in male-only herds while the females live separately and raise their babies on their own. And it's kind of funny, during the summer, bull moose are almost best friends. And by the time the rut comes, 
and competition increases, they become mortal enemies. Of course, by the time winter comes, they're going to reunite and kind of reestablish those friendships. A lot of animals in the park, like elk and deer, will herd up to actually protect themselves against carnivores like wolves and mountain lions. However, moose live largely solitary lives, and that's because they're big enough to actually fight back, to fight their predators. And so the predators of a, of a moose include grizzly bears, black bears, gray wolves, and even mountain lions. But typically those predators are feeding mainly on calves and winter weekend moose. So moose that haven't been feeding very well during the summer and are weak from the winter conditions. In the summer, those calves though are very vulnerable to predation from bears and wolves and mountain lions. And so the female moose are very protective and it's incredibly important to give female moose during the summer a wide berth. This here is a female moose feeding on water vegetation, which is very important to their diet during the summer months. In Grand Teton and Yellowstone National Park, it is recommended that you stay at least 25 meters or 75 feet away from adult moose, especially females with calves. Well, thanks everyone for tuning in to Wildlife Wednesdays. My name is Tyler Greenlee, and I hope you all have a wonderful evening. So a big thanks to Tyler for his inaugural showing here at the Wildlife Wednesday broadcast. He's definitely given us video that we've shown before, but we finally got him to put his face on screen. I hope you guys enjoyed hearing from him. Do let us know in the comment section. We want Tyler to do it again. Maybe we'll get him to talk about birds next time. But in the meantime, I do want to let everybody know that we'd love to see who's watching this broadcast and if anybody actually ends up coming to Jackson Hole. So if you book a wildlife tour or any tour that we offer, we do cross country skiing or snowshoeing in the next 48 hours and you mention Wildlife Wednesday when you book, we're going to give you 10% off every week uh, for the time being off of these Wildlife Wednesday broadcasts. So just a reminder, if you feel like you might be coming to Jackson Hole in the next year you could certainly get 10 percent off if you're interested in that and of course we do take requests for guides and for sightings and everything else so if you see a guide every week uh in wildlife wednesday laura perhaps or sarah ernst who we're going to hear from next do let us know we're happy to sign you up i've been actually taking out quite a few wildlife wednesday viewers over the last couple weeks when i've been out in the field because folks have been requesting me which of course is a great honor i'm very flattered but definitely find your favorite guide every week and uh, if you're in Jackson Hole we'd love to have you meet in person it's a lot of fun to see everybody coming from all over the world out there we have really really safe trips right now running with COVID conditions everybody's got a mask on we're using alcohol and sterilizing all of our equipment and vehicles it's a really good time we're running private only trips right now when we're going out in the field so feel safe come on out with us if you want to do so in the meantime, let's hear from Sarah Ernst, who was up in Yellowstone after our recent snowstorm. We had a huge, huge storm come through Wyoming with 35 mile an hour winds up to 70 mile an hour gusts. We've got lots of trees down in the valley. All of the snow is now melted off of the valley floor, but it was a pretty exciting couple of days until it did. At 4 p.m. it was 75 degrees and by midnight it was below freezing and we woke up to a couple inches of snow in Grand Teton and Yellowstone National Park. Sarah Ernst was out with her guests in Yellowstone. Let's check in with her. This is guide Sarah Ernst with Eco Tour Adventures, and we've just set up a picnic table with the bison here on the Firehole River in Yellowstone. We just got some snow after long temperatures at 80 degrees, and the bison have begun their migration to the geyser basins and open meadows around the geothermal areas of western, southwestern Yellowstone. The bison you see grazing behind me have been following these paths for several thousand years, we think, based on archaeological evidence of the Native Americans' use of this area. 
And this is the only herd in the entire United States that follows its ancestral migration route. Every other herd of bison in the United States has been reintroduced. So the knowledge contained in the heads of those female leading bison have been passed on in a line going back um, thousands of years into the history of Yellowstone. So as we're eating lunch with the bison in rare, rare opportunities like this where we're having lunch with the bison themselves, it's nice to think about that history. So always a favorite uh, on our Wildlife Wednesday broadcast, a big thanks to Sarah Ernst, who also is new to our team this year, although certainly not new to guiding in the valley. I think she's been guiding for something like a decade or something like that in Jackson Hole. So we're certainly happy to have her as well, trying to get some new faces so you get a chance to meet all of our guides. There's just a couple we haven't featured um, over this last summer. We'll get them in before the fall, uh, before the snow starts to fly, and we kind of shift into our beautiful golden aspens, late fall conditions and winter. Speaking of which, our fall photo workshop still has just a couple spaces left uh, in early October. If you're interested in that, I think Maddie can probably put a link up for us um, of our fall photo workshop details. If you've always wanted to be here in the fall, watch the elk rut and the bison bash heads and what have you, uh, that's a great time to go. We're gonna have um, professional photographer there to teach you how to get the great photos you've always wanted to in Grand Teton and Yellowstone. I'm not here to advertise that you guys, but I did want to let you know there were a couple seats left because it is a once in a lifetime opportunity uh, and I didn't want to have you miss it. Okay. So this is my favorite part. Well, second favorite part of the broadcast. It's time for our trivia question of the week. So last week I asked you about an x-ray. Does anybody remember that? And I asked you to identify the animal in the x-ray. Let me go ahead and show it to you again. Now this is last week's question. You can't win a gift card with last week's question. We've already awarded the gift card for last week. But go ahead and comment in the comment section if you know which animal this is. I gave you guys some hints last week, um, which is to say if you look, this is definitely an animal in the order carnivora. It's got all carnivore-based teeth. Uh, no grindy molars there, right? So it's definitely a straight carnivore, not an omnivore. And we know that for two reasons. First of all, it doesn't have omnivore molars, right? Humans are omnivores. So we have big pointy teeth up front, which are our canines. And then we've got grindy teeth in the back, which are our molars. Herbivores are going to have just grindy teeth and choppy teeth. And carnivores are going to have all pointy choppy teeth. So this is all choppy teeth, really flat faced animal. Feel free to guess in the comment section if you've got any guesses what this is. I'm going to go ahead and give you guys a hint as I did last week. It is in the cat family and it is in fact the largest member of the cat family. It is in fact a mountain lion. So if you guessed that correctly, Good for you guys. Uh, I'm very impressed for sure. A lot of people got that right last week. I thought I really had gotten you guys a stumper and uh, I can't seem to stump you. So <laughs> we got some super smart watchers in this broadcast. If you guys have enjoyed my x-rays, I think that's the second x-ray I've shown you. I've been working on an art project where I have been x-raying wildlife skulls over the years. I'm also, besides being a wildlife biologist, I'm also a veterinary technician by training. So I know how to use an x-ray, which is helpful. Uh, so if you wanna see more x-rays as trivia questions, we can certainly do that. Let me know in the comment section. But it's time, of course, for this week's trivia question. Now, some of you guys had asked to purchase the photograph behind me. Um, and we figure when we are giving away our gift card to the Jacksonville Eco Tour Adventure store, um, we might as well let you know that we finally do have this available in the store, as well as Steo wear. Um, Elise, our guide, Elise has these really cool knitted hats. We've got um, uh, um, these really cool illustrated owl stickers from our wolf biologist friend, Kira Cassidy. We've got amazing photographs, prints, drawings, gunpowder art from our naturalist, Chelsea. Uh, Maddie will go ahead and put a link in the comment section. But for those of you guys who've been asking to purchase Grand Prismatic here, which was last week's trivia question, we do have it available for you finally. Maddie will put the um, link in the comment section. But this week's question, and you have to answer in the comment section for a chance to win. You gotta answer correctly. 
I thought I'd give you one that if you've been watching Wildlife Wednesday, you're going to know the answer right away. But maybe if you haven't had a chance yet, uh, you might not know because I haven't mentioned it this week on purpose. I am looking for the name of the most famous daughter of Grizzly Bear 399. So, Grizzly Bear 399, as Laura was explaining to us, the most famous grizzly bear in the world. She's famous for being old. She's also famous for having had three sets of triplets and now a set of quadruplets, but also for basically single-handedly repopulating Northern Grand Teton National Park with grizzly bears. Sadly, over 50% of her offspring have been killed usually because of human-based issues. So they've either been hit by cars or they've gotten into trouble with cattle or bird feeders or some of these other conflicts. Only one of her adult females continuously breeds in Grand Teton National Park. And this female is one of the original set of triplets that Grizzly Bear 399 had. I am looking for the name, which is the, of course, identification number, of that bear. So if you know the name of that bear, she currently has two two-year-old cubs. We talk about her a lot on Wildlife Wednesdays. She lives in Northern Grand Teton National Park and she's almost as beloved as her mother. Some people like to call Grizzly Bear 399 the queen, which I think is a little bit anthropomorphic and giving her some human traits. So I'm not quite sure how I feel about that. And they call the quads the Fab Four. Uh, some people call Grizzly Bear 610 the troublemaker because she's famous for, among other things, bluff charging large crowds when they don't let her cross roads with her cubs. A few years ago, um, somebody actually threw an apple at her through a, a moon roof and uh, she charged their car because she didn't like getting hit by an apple. That's pretty understandable. And very commonly this time of year, she makes her way down into Southern Grand Teton National Park for the berry harvest. So if you know the name of that bear, oh my gosh, I'm looking down at our comment section and so many people are getting this right. I thought for sure I might stump some of you. Is there a question I can ask that's like hard enough that you guys aren't gonna get it? Cause really. <laughs> Maybe I won't give away any more hints. Maybe I'm making it too easy. Uh, but long story short, go ahead and answer in the comment section for your chance to win that gift card. And we will definitely let the lucky winner know this week who they are. All right, so that's my second favorite section of the broadcast. Now we get to my favorite section, which is if you have a question for a wildlife biologist or anybody in your household has a question for a wildlife biologist, uh, whether they're four years old or, you know, a hundred years old, I'm here to answer your questions live. So go ahead and ask them in the comments section and I'll see if I can get you some answers. Now, I've got all of your comments showing up on my iPad here. So when I'm looking down, it's because I'm looking at your questions. So bear with me while I take a look and we'll see if we can't get you guys some answers. Let's see here. Oh my God, so many people got this right. Oh my gosh. Let's see here. All right. So let me start at the top here. Um, we did have a question that was asked um, ahead of time. Somebody sent us a message um, through our direct mail. They went ahead and sent us a message through our Facebook, uh, they said they didn't want to ask the comments, uh, the questions, I understand, I didn't read the, the original message, but they maybe didn't want to ask it in the comments section during the broadcast, but they really wanted to know the answer and they wanted to remain anonymous. So we'll start with that one. So for whoever answered that, asked this question, I hope you're listening, but I'm glad to ask you anyway. The question was, um, how do elk grow and then shed their antlers? Um, I'm trying to find this question here in the comment section and I'm not finding it, but Long story short, the question was basically that they were confused because if you were to say dehorn a cow, um, it would leave a, a hole, which would need to be you know healed over, um, which certainly would be open to infection and these other sorts of things. So how on earth is an elk able to grow an antler every year and then shed that antler every year and then regrow it? So I think for starters, it's useful to explain the difference between horns and antlers. Um, horns are bony projections from the head that do not branch or prong and stay with the animal their whole life. So think bighorn sheep 
or a bison or the like. That's going to be a horn. An antler is a bony projection from the head that um, branches or prongs in a shed every year. So think something like an elk antler. And um, up until actually relatively recently, we didn't really understand how antlers grew and how antlers shed. So uh, for the person who was asking that question, thinking it was a silly question, um, it wasn't. Biologists couldn't have given you an answer um, until relatively recently. The sort of short version of how this works is antlers are grown from um, a little bony area in the skull called a pedicle. And the pedicle grows outward with soft um, kind of cartilage-based tissue. If you were to touch the tip of an elk or a deer's antlers in the spring, it, they'd be soft. They'd be sort of squishy. They wouldn't be hard at all. And then these animals grow velvet, just like you saw the moose shedding its velvet early on with that Tyler's video. Um, and that velvet provides a vascular system. It provides a blood flow to allow the antlers to continue growing because they grow from the tips, out from the pedicle, and then keep growing out from the tips. And an elk can grow up to 40 pounds of antler, 40 pounds of antler a year. They're growing an inch of bone a day. Moose can grow antlers that are far larger than that. Antler is the fastest growing bone in the world. So pretty, pretty darn amazing. So when it comes to how do they shed their antlers, still not fully understood, but we know that that pedicle contains a certain type of cell called an osteoclast. And an osteoclast has the ability to break down. It's a, a bone cell that will um, naturally break down in the presence of certain hormones. So basically, when it's um, past the breeding season, the testosterone levels in the bull elk fall, then that osteoclast gets activated by the lower rates of testosterone and it starts to break down. And the osteoclast sort of breaks away, breaks away, breaks away at the pedicle until the antler falls off. It's actually pretty clever. So there's no hole in their head. The pedicle right at the base there, that little, those cells are still there. Um, and that area is used to grow the antler the next year. But because of the action of these osteoclasts, which humans have osteoclasts as well, it's how, for instance, we regrow bone, um, or we dissolve bone, like bone spurs, for instance, all throughout the body, but particularly in the spinal cord. But it's those actions of those osteoclasts at the base of the, the antler called the pedicle that allows those antlers to be shed every year. So trivia, just for all of you all who are just as goofy as I am. Um, so elk shed their antlers um, in early winter, but reindeer, who also have antlers, um, they're one of the few species where both the male and the female, reindeer and caribou, uh, do have antlers. The females actually keep their antlers far longer than the males. The, the males shed their antlers in November, but the females don't shed their antlers until much later. So if you're looking at images of Santa's sleigh, all the reindeer have, have antlers, which is to suggest to me that all of the reindeer uh, pulling Santa's sleigh are probably female. Unless the person who was illustrating those reindeer, who had seen those reindeer, was just getting confused or what have you. But I'm just saying, girls save the day once again. They save Christmas, right? So just a random thought for that. Let's see what other questions we have this week. I could go on and on about antlers, but I'm not exactly sure you all want to hear me do that. Let's see here. So Michael asks, are moose antlers shed like elk antlers? If not, what's the difference between them? So the shedding mechanism, the osteoplast and the pedicle, exactly the same, but the shape is different. Elk antlers are built for sparring and fighting, um, and moose antlers are built more for display. So that moose antler's got that big paddle with that filled in bone in the middle, um, which is much better to sort of show off your antlers. And elk antlers are long, almost more sword-like, which is much better to fight with. Now, people are always sort of disappointed to hear this, but the vast majority of the time, if one bull meets another bull, I was out last night and I got some great video that I couldn't quite turn around in time for this, for this week, maybe next week, where these two bulls were looking at each other with a little side eye, bugling at each other last night, having a debate over who was the bigger guy and who got to get all the girls. And they sat there and they stared at each other and my guests were going, oh, this is great, they're gonna fight. And I said, probably not. Usually it doesn't come to a fight unless they're awfully evenly matched 
One bowl was clearly smaller than the other. The one who had the harem, the girls, the cow elk, was definitely smaller than the bull who was coming in. And sure enough, once that bull got out about 50 yards away from this bull and his harem, the first bull took off. He knew he was beat. There was no fight. And then the bigger bull came in and took over his harem of females. So most of the time it doesn't come to a fight. Um, sometimes uh, it does, but pretty rarely with elk. Um, it's usually a brief sparring situation. Moose, it comes to a conflict even less. They mostly display and show off. And so as a result, uh, moose antlers are built more to sort of display. They're not actually built as much for fighting. So occasionally moose antlers will actually get stuck together. Um, there was a very famous case when I was a little girl in Jackson Hole where they actually had a sharpshooter, I think from the local army base, actually shoot a pair of antlers apart uh, because these two moose had been stuck together uh, for quite some time, I think weeks, and they were going to starve to death unless something was done and nobody wants to go in <laughs> and separate two giant bull moose full of testosterone who are really upset being stuck together. So they're actually able to... Um, use a sharpshooter to actually break the antlers and the moose were able to separate on the National Elk Refuge and, and both of them ended up surviving. Remember, of course, that the bone, uh, once it doesn't have velvet in it on it anymore and the velvet shed is, is dead bone, so it wouldn't be painful to have their antlers shot apart. They weren't being cruel, they were trying to save the moose. But great question. Thanks very much for that one. That's really fun. Let's see what else we've got here. Alessa says, told our granddaughter about the female reindeer. They might be, but Rudolph's a boy. I agree. Rudolph's definitely a boy. And, you know, with all those antlers, might be you just didn't see them without the antlers, right? Because they're all blending together. Look at your picture of Santa with Santa's sleigh, and I bet you you'll see Rudolph for sure. Uh, he's definitely a boy. Let's see what we got here. Oh, what's a grizzly bear's gestation period, says Karen. That's a great question. Um, grizzly bears practice delayed implantation. So you ready? I'm about to blow your mind. <laughs> so they breed in the spring, and then they, they fertilize um, up to five eggs, sometimes from different males, and then they hold those fertilized eggs in stasis. They don't just let them sit there until about December where they implant a certain number of eggs into their uterus. Then those eggs gestate for a very short period of time. The grizzly usually gives birth in January or February. So basically somewhere between two and three months. But grizzly bears almost have what I'd call a double pregnancy. Um, you'll see this with panda bears as well. So they give birth to this tiny, tiny, tiny young, just an inch or two in length. Um, which will immediately begin to suckle on the hibernating mother who's asleep. Um, I asked a, a good friend of mine who's a bear biologist one time, do you think the, the bear wakes up for the labor and delivery? Because <laughs> having recently gone through that myself, I, I would think you'd be awake for that. And, and they said, well, we don't know, um, but probably. So the bear probably briefly wakes up from their... Uh, well, it's probably called anestivation, but we'll call it hibernation for simplicity's sake. And then probably goes back to sleep. And that little itty bitty cub actually suckles for, far, for a bunch more months, usually until um, late April. And then they go ahead and emerge from the den from their mother. So it's a very short gestation, just a couple months. So great question. Thank you very much for that. Let's see here. What else we got? I want to make sure I'm not skipping anybody. Let's see here. Mike asks, how's the smoke in Grand Teton National Park? Obviously, as the air blows from west to east, uh, blows from Oregon and California and the wildfires there, which are just devastating and we wish everybody out there the best, uh, we're getting a lot of smoke in Jackson Hole. We also have a local fire, the Lone Star Fire in Yellowstone, which continues to burn, which is generating some smoke. There's also some fires going on in Colorado. Um, I think most of the fires in Idaho are out, but you know, it's still fire season. So it really depends on the day. We've had days that are pretty clear to the point where it'd be hard to tell there's any smoke. Um, and then we've had other days that were a little bit more smoky, but generally speaking, the smoke is improving every day. It's not bad at all out there. Today, um, 
smoke conditions weren't bad at all. Might be a little hazy perhaps, but certainly not to the point where you're gonna cough or feel like you're choking or those really bad smoky days. So we hope that those wildfires in Oregon and California are under control soon uh, and that people are safe out there. But in the meantime, yeah, our smoke is improving. We got a little smoky uh, last week certainly, but we're, we're making some progress. So great question there. Ah, how's the smoke affecting wildlife? Wildlife are actually evolved to, to handle wildfires. Um, our local dominant tree type in the valley floor, lodgepole pine trees, is built to burn. You heard Laura talking a little bit about that with her video with 399. Um, it doesn't affect them as much as it affects people. They tend to do just fine with smoke, so no big issues for them there. So great question. Let's see here. Oh, how many different squirrel species in the two parks? Don, that's a great question. You're making my brain hurt. So we've got 42 species of rodent in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. Um, when it comes to squirrel, I'm assuming you mean things like ground squirrels, chipmunks, everything in the same family as squirrels. Um, off the top of my head, I have to think about this. We've got least chipmunks, two types of squirrels. Uh, you went to ground squirrels. Maddie in the comment section will hopefully help, help me, but I think four or five is the number we have in the squirrel family. So great question there. Kelly asks, will 399 need a bigger den this year? The four cubs are getting big. Yes, they are getting big. Um, I have never gone and visited 399's den, and, and I know where it is. Um, although that's a very closely guarded secret so people don't harass her in the wintertime. Uh, but I've chosen to not go over there. I don't want to leave my scent, even if it's in midsummer. Um, the only dens I've spent any time on are ones I know have been abandoned for at least two or three years. I go in the dead of summer when I know nothing is going to be there. Um, and 399 does like to use the same area to den every year. She certainly could dig a bigger den or she could enlarge her den if she needed more room. But remember, she's denned with triplets before, so um, she's on the case, she knows what she's doing. And uh, those big claws are built for digging. If she needs to dig a little bit more, she certainly will be able to do so. Not a problem, I think she's probably on the case. She's so old at this point that if anybody knows how to dig a den, it's her, whether she digs a fresh one or she continues to use the same one. Some grizzlies make a new den every year. They never use the same one. Other ones like to use the same one, or they may use it for a couple years, then use a different one, then go back to the original. It's not uncommon for them to dig out um, things like wolf dens um, or other animal dens, and then vice versa. Wolves might dig out an old grizzly den and reuse it as well, because a good hole is a good hole, right? So great question there. Let's see here. Michael asks, do antlers fall off at the same time or can the left fall off and then the right? Michael, sometimes they fall off exactly at the same time and I've seen that happen. The elk's just walking and then poof, they just fall off. It's bizarre. Um, usually they shake their head a little bit and that kind of causes them to pop. There's a theory out there that, there that maybe when they're getting ready to come off it itches because you'll see them kind of thrashing a bit, kind of itching with their feet. Um, hard to know. Nobody can really ask the elk to ask. But just as likely you can have one shed and then 100 yards later see the other shed. Uh, so either way, both can happen. It's not necessarily a sign of health or non-health. There's been some studies done on this, you know, are the best antlers shed at the same time. Not necessarily, it just depends on the animal. Sometimes they're able to kind of bash one on a tree enough to get it off, but can't quite get a good angle on the same tree for the other side and it just takes a little bit longer. Um, but yeah, either way works. Let's see here. When do the bears start to hibernate? Why is it the cold or the snow or what? Lee, that's a great question. Bear species, generally speaking, don't have to hibernate. So for instance, bears in Florida 
generally don't hibernate. If you think of winter as a time of famine rather than a time of cold, the bears are actually hibernating because of uh, less food. They're not hibernating because of it being cold outside. So for instance, zoo bears oftentimes don't hibernate because they're getting enough to eat. There's another hormonal function. A lot of this stuff is run by hormones, if you haven't noticed, just like it is in people, where if the number of calories they're getting is, they're, t they're taking in is less than the number of calories they're burning, uh, they get this hormone that sort of activates that makes them sleepy and causes them to go into hibernation. Um, if they live in a tropical area like black bears might, then they may never get that trigger to hibernate. Um, some bears, for instance, polar bears up in the Arctic, uh, females will always, who are, who are pregnant, will always den um, because that's how they're gonna gestate their young as we were speaking about earlier. But male bears, they may not go into hibernation. And if a bear's body condition, um, they eat up all their body fat and they don't have enough food reserves and body fat to survive, they'll actually wake back up midwinter and continue to forage. So um, it's not the cold that's triggering it, it's the lack of food. So great question, thanks very much for that, Lee. We appreciate it. Let's see here. Do bears get mange? Don, that's a great question. Um, bears get a type of mange, but it's very rare, it's very unusual. Um, for all of you guys who are going, huh? mange is a mite that lives at the base of a hair. Um, it's very itchy and irritable. Uh, generally speaking, mange is species specific. So there is a bear mange that can be given to other bears. Because bears are solitary, they tend not to give it to each other very effectively. Animals who live in community groups like say wolves or coyotes are far more likely to have problems with mange in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem or mangy dogs, right? Um, elk will get a form of mange, elk, moose, deer, called scabies, which is a type of mange. And because they live in herds, they really spread it amongst each other. You can tell the elk that have bad cases of it, particularly the bulls, because they'll scratch all the hair off their backs with their antlers because they can kind of get at it and it's itchy. We don't see it very often at all with bears. They'd have to be in contact with other bears in order to acquire it, but it certainly is possible. So great question. Thank you very much for that. Aaron asks, oh gosh, what is the biggest bear paw imprint I have found? Well, Aaron, it's funny you ask that because um, I'm a little obsessed with animal tracks. And what I love to do is pour plaster of Paris um, in animal tracks. And, and what I'll do is I'll actually, when I hike, I'll take two Nalgene's, one just for regular water and another water bottle just for plaster. And then I've got a Ziploc bag full of plaster of Paris. Um, and then I also have duct tape wrapped around my trekking pole and I have thin cardboard. Um, I'm very grateful to um, uh, John Halfpenny, very, very famous biologist and tracking expert in the Great Yellowstone Ecosystem, who I got my tracking certification from for teaching me this technique. So um, thin cardboard, not corrugated cardboard that you can sort of flex. And what you do is you find a great track out in the field and you can create a ring out of that thin strip of cardboard that you can just lay in the bottom of your pack. You can mix your plaster um, and your water together. If you've got um, some of those old Nalgene's that have the, the bad plastic, what's that plastic called that used to be in old Nalgene's that you don't want to drink water from anymore, this is a great use for that. You go ahead and shake up that water bottle with the plaster in it and then you pour it into the track and you can get a perfect replica of it. I, I never measured the number of inches of my, my biggest grizzly track, but I did find it in Northern Grand Teton National Park. There was a smaller track nearby, so I know it was a female, not a male, um, and it's hard to judge, but um, I keep in mind the back feet are far bigger than the front feet on a grizzly, but uh, that's about right. And what I love to do is I'm also a ceramic artist, so I'll actually push porcelain um, into those tracks and make replicas. So. Uh, so that's something people want to see in the store, by the way. I'm more than happy to send you one, but yeah, uh, yay big. So what, a foot's like this big, so maybe two feet or something along those lines? Big tracks out there. Best time to do it is in the spring or fall when there's been lots of rain. Sometimes they'll walk on muddy roads and just leave perfect impressions. So that's a great way to do it. Thank you very much for that. Ah! Perfect, Maddie, the expert here, has told us about all our ground squirrels. You went to ground squirrel, least ch chipmunk, golden-mantled ground squirrel, and American red squirrel. So that's four, not five. 
So there you go. There's your answer to that one. Let's see here. I think, I think that's all our questions. So guys, this has been so much fun. It's a pleasure uh, spending every Wednesday with you all. A big thanks to the Travel and Tourism Board for their grant that's allowing us to broadcast this out to the world. If there's something you'd like to see next week, we take requests, go ahead and tell me in the comment section. Big thanks to Maddie for managing our comments. Make sure you say hi to him. It's been a wonderful week. I hope you all have a wild weekend and you're safe and a good next week. We'll see you then. Bye-bye.